All right. Um, is it recording? Yes. So we, the, the way the town IT likes to have it work is that instead of a meeting, it's a webinar. And so when there's a webinar, um, the committee members or board members become panelists. And so you can unmute yourself and do your video and share things freely, but then members of the public are attendees and they can only listen and they, um, you know, we can promote them to panelists so they can be a part of the conversation or they can raise their hand. So for the attendees, looks like we have three of them. You can, um, if you hover over your name as a participant in the, the attendees, you can say, um, you know, you can say, raise your hand and then we can, I'll see it and we can allow them to talk. So that's really the difference. And so if you have a meeting, basically everyone is the same uh, level of participation in terms of being able to talk freely. But as a webinar, the panelists are the ones who talk freely. Um, so, you know, we're not having, for instance, if we had 20 guests and they were all at the same level, they could talk as, you know, throughout, uh, not that they would, but the concern is that sometimes people like, you know, Zoom bomb meetings and they post stuff they shouldn't or they, they do yep. things, yeah, which, which has happened, I guess, to a few town, uh -huh. uh, council, yeah. town council meetings and others, so. Um, I heard about a meditation Zoom session today that got bombed. Why would someone bomb a meditation? I don't know. Yeah, no, we, I've had, um, yeah, it's funny, I've had some, um, I've had it happen where people call in, it seems like they're, they don't say much, but they're not, you know, it's strange that they're there. I don't think they're, I think they just, they listen, but, um, so I think we're ready. We have a quorum at 7.07 .07 now on my computer. Tom, you would, uh, I believe you're the vice chair, so you can act as chair. Well, I'm, I'm honored to have that title bestowed on me. I, I don't recall, but um, I'm looking at the, um, the agenda and uh, I can look at the agenda. Wait a minute. Sure, I can share my screen too. Well, wait a minute. I can sort of, yeah, I can sort of see everybody and look at it if I minimize the, the, the uh, agenda. So um, I did speak briefly with John. Uh, he apologizes. Um, apparently uh, he had a real close call and uh, is now back at home. Okay. Um, wow. And uh, he's feeling better and he's resting and uh, he is very grateful for that and uh, wishes he could be with us. But he did say that there were a couple of things he wanted to make sure that we covered tonight. And um, I'll make sure we, um, we focus on those as we go through the agenda. Um, Great. The first thing is any announcements. Okay. Uh, I think, no, um, I was gonna mention that, you know, a few members uh, terms expire on June 30th. And so that's just, you know, that's something the town manager is aware of and the, the town's aware of. So we'll just, you know, there'll be, there'll be an email, so I can send one out, but we can just see if members are willing to, um, you know, remain on the, on the trust. I think there's a few that have uh, terms that expire. So I just, I just wanted to mention that. Um, okay. Any other announcements? Okay. Um, the minutes. Hey. Could I just see a show of hands of who is able to see all of the attachments that they uh, that were distributed? Do people just raise their hand on the screen and just so I can see? Um, so, so Nate is sharing on his screen. So we can, whatever attachment you want us to look at, he can post. On yeah. Screen. Okay. But but I mean, there's. Okay. I guess we could do that. We could just switch around. Good point, Paul. Okay, so, um, all right, minutes. Um, is there uh, a motion to accept the minutes? I so move. I'll second it. Carol seconded. If it needs to be seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of accepting the minutes? Just a second. Oh, you have a comment, Paul? Yeah, the the uh, all votes when you're meeting uh, remotely have to be taken as a roll call. Oh. If you take any motion, it has to be oh. as a roll call, roll call okay. vote. All right, Nate, could you do that? You'll be the sergeant at arms here. 
Or um, yeah, if we can, um, Tom, maybe you do it. I, I actually, I'm actually taking notes too at by the old uh, pen and paper here, so I can, um, I'll write that down. Okay. So Paul. Yes. And Sid. Yes. Carol. Yes. And I'm not seeing. Uh, wait a minute. I don't have the full screen here. Rob, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> okay. I don't yes. know why. Oh, okay. Now I see. And um, was there anyone else that? Will. Will. No. Okay. And, oh, yeah. and Will. Yeah. I don't know why it's not showing me everybody. You can maybe drag in the corner. You can you can make your grid uh, panel bigger so you can see everyone. Oh. That's very helpful. Thanks, Nate. Okay. Um, okay, so we have unanimous. Uh, next item on the agenda, I'm going to trust you, Nate, to... Sure, I can go back to the agenda. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, report from Craig's Doors. Um, so is, is Kevin um, with us? I don't I see Kevin as a... Um, as an attendee, I, I emailed them a little bit ago. Let me just check my email. I don't see that he's here or that he's emailed me. Oh, okay. I know that John was um, interested in hearing from Kevin that uh, there's a lot going on and um, he had some interest in asking to see whether the um, whether the shelter could remain open after the end of April. Um, and I don't know if you have any information on that, Nate or Paul, do you know what issues they might have? Or should we just table this until we hear from Kevin? Yeah, I don't have much information. You know, what um, John had shared a while ago, and I, I'll just pull it up on the screen. You know, it looks like it's from Jay Levy. It was the, you know, the 2020 count of, yeah persons who are experiencing homelessness. So the, um, you know, just to help show the need, I don't, I don't have any more about what Kevin was going to report on, you know, possibly right. just the season and where they're going uh, in the Did future. You, were you my, raising your hand, Sid? I, I thought, no. My, my, yeah, understanding, I my understanding, Tom, is that um, uh, the shelter is going to be closing on April 30th as scheduled. I think that's the arrangement they've always had with the church. Yeah. But I guess there was, John had heard that there was some uh, issue considered, uh, considering the increased number of homeless, whether there might be some uh, need to try to find some alternate space or expand it or extend it or, okay. Well, I'm, I'm just speculating here. Uh, I was hoping for Kevin to report on that. So unless we hear from him later, we'll have to table that one. Okay, John, uh, Nate, back to the agenda. Sure, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm surprised I haven't heard from Kevin. Um, okay. Yeah, if he, comes, if he comes in later, we can just, uh, you know, have him join. The, um, yeah. yeah, so next on the agenda was, uh, I hope, can everyone see that clearly enough? I'm, I never know the way I- I can I see, see it. it. Yes, I can see it. Yep. Okay, um, so the short-term emergency rental program, that was an important one that John wanted us to discuss, consider, and um, if favorable to, to approve it. Um, I think he said that you helped with that, Rita, with that. Yes. Could you talk about it a little bit? Sure. Um... I mean, I mean, Rita, I have, um... So we have a few things that were emailed out that are also yeah. shared tonight. One is a draft program guideline. Okay. We can uh, have that up here. So I'm not sure where the, um, you know, if it was John or, or somebody in the, the town that um, kind of initiated this idea of um, looking at how the town might serve uh, households who are affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly renters. And it's a issue that's being discussed kind of statewide. Yesterday, there was a 
um, a workshop, a Zoom workshop held by MHP, my former employer, and CHAPA, which is a statewide housing um, advocacy organization. Um, there were more than 400 people who, um, who participated. And uh, what, the, what the whole training, what the workshop was about is that there have been a lot of communities who stepped up to say um, we're really concerned with um, just interrupt a second there's some there's some bunch of background noise from someplace uh, is uh if, if everybody who's not talking could mute maybe we could make it go away including me which i sure okay. yeah, i don't know if someone was playing music or listening to the radio or uh, maybe it's just like an echo i can okay do you need me to start over carol Oh, maybe I can't see you, so I'll just share. I'll just keep over. going, keep going. It's okay. I just wanted, before it got worse or something, sure. I just wanted to point it out. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks. so um, uh, a lot of communities are very concerned about low and moderate income renters. I mean, low and moderate income homeowners too, but um, renters, uh, for people who are, who are renting, there's um, kind of an you know, a program that was, um, that, that the CPA program is particularly suited to assisting people who are having trouble paying their rent. So I, um, uh, I took some of the, um, the outlines. So MHP had done kind of a basic, pro, you know, communities are interested. They had done sort of a, an outline of what the program might look like and what it should incorporate. And I went beyond that and actually um, developed a set of um, draft program guidelines and looked at what a scope of services might be for an administrator and then what the qualifications that we would be looking for an administrator. Um, the thinking is that the trust currently has money in its coffers that could be um, reprogrammed for an emergency rental assistance program and that um, ideally that could be uh, increased with some additional CPA funds, but obviously the Community Preservation Committee has gone through its process and has made its initial recommendations whether um, the, we could reprogram the, the trust money that they've already approved or look at some other funding from the CPC, but that would have to go through the process of going to the CPC, then going to town council for approval. Um, so what, what you're seeing in front of you are some draft program guidelines starting with um, eligibility. And uh, I think John feels pretty strongly about this being um, a program that serves um, households that have children. It's not, that's not specified here, but what is specified is um, a number of things. And I don't know if you want me to say, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go through them, not line by line, but kind of just give you the, the highlights. Um, so what we're talking about is um, serving households, uh, people who are currently residing in the town of Amherst. Um, they have reduced or no income um, because of COVID-19. Their immigration status is not a bar to receiving assistance. They have to earn less than 80% of AMI, which is in number two, gives you those actual figures. Um, this would be targeted to families who are not currently living in um, state or federally subsidized public housing or who are currently receiving section eight um, mass rental voucher program or raft because those uh, families who are living either living in public housing or who have um, section 8 assistance they can do an income recertification so if you had a family that whose income was significantly reduced their rent can be reduced by the um, whoever is providing the subsidy for them um, a question that came up right away of course is what about students and um, my recommendation, although this can certainly be changed, is that, um, that we follow the same rules that govern the um, low income housing tax credit program. And I have those, um, 
in front of me and, and I can go through them. It's, it's pretty much, you know, you can't have uh, like undergraduates. It would have to be a family. There would have to be, um, uh, they'd have to be sort of, say if the parent was a full-time student and then you have children in the house. So they're, they're pretty, it's very limited about um, serving students. Um, why don't I stop there and see if you have any questions um, about what I've talked about so far in terms of eligibility. Sorry, I do have a dog in the background. <laughs> Carol? <laughs> Carol, you should, we should unmute Carol. Uh, she can unmute herself if you'd like, right, Carol? I'm, on, I'm unmuted. I was just trying to, uh, I would just uh, a matter of, well, two things. One of them is, what does it mean immigration status is not a bar? What would be a, what, what thing? So if you're, if you're undocumented, that, that you would be eligible. Would be eligible, you would yes. not? Would be, yes, would be. would be. Okay, super. And the other thing is, I'm, I'm just remembering from that thing that uh, I was one of the 400 people at yesterday. <laughs> it seemed like they were saying it was, uh, you should be careful making criteria that weren't clearly economic or that weren't about where you live right now, which makes me wonder about the thing about people with children, how I just don't even, I don't even know if that, I don't know. I just don't understand how that would happen or if it's possible to have it happen without running afoul of some kind of fair housing law. Yeah, and that's a very good point, I think. Um, uh, you can certainly, as a community, um, say it's to serve a household. Um, fair housing, you might get into a situation where you said only individuals who work in a certain industry or, you know, laid off by whatever. It could very well be that, yes, if you were to say households with um, children, that that could be construed as a fair housing. And I will follow up on that. I do think right now, Carol, um, just say the, the the eligible criteria doesn't say that. Um, it's not. I know. I was saying sort of what John was. Right. You know, if you if I read that, I don't see. I do think you know we try to define a household. Um, we have that in our zoning bylaw, but it doesn't. The eligibility doesn't really say families with children. So, mm -hmm. I think the idea is John hopes that it'll help families with children. Right. Um, but you know, any household really can apply. Uh, you know, students are difficult because they don't meet the eligibility, most of them through the low-income housing tax credit program criteria, but. Um, um, so I just, may, I know Will had a question. I just, I just had a question, is the uh, AMI calculation based on 2019 earnings or is it based it's on 2020 earnings? 2020. Okay. So it's they, they um, were just updated. Okay. Well, so yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious. I mean, like I know, for example, like in my business, we hired a bunch of people and then we had to furlough a number of them and their projected 2020 earnings are way less <laughs> right. now, you know, it's like, so if you looked at their pay stubs for the first three months of the year, they, I mean, they would qualify, but like it's conceivable that they wouldn't qualify if you looked at their pay stubs where it's prospectively, I, I don't know. It just seems no, it's a good it's a good question and a question that a lot of communities have asked. So um, it's it's addressed in the next um, section on income certification. Um, what a lot of communities have been talking about is um, is looking from the you know the point that the time of of application or um, yeah so from the time of application and then trying to project forward. Um, for three months, so not looking backward, um, because we have a lot of people that um, were gainfully employed and, you know, di didn't have a lot of savings, might have been slightly over this, and then, boom, they don't have anything. Um, one thing that I know that the city of Boston, which kind of jumped on a, a rental assistance program right away, is they did do a um, kind of an asset test. And I don't know what um, figures they were using because it's, it's a, there's not a whole lot of detail when I went to research what their um, qualification, you know, what their criteria were. 
but you know, I, I think that's where we might need to do some more refining is, you know, how is the income certification done? And if you have a household that has other options, I think, you know, we should be serving the most, um, the, the folks who have the greatest need. And so if you have other options, then um, either, you know, family support or a whole lot of savings, um, you know, I think they, they should take a, a back seat to, to a household that has um, really limited, no savings um, and no income. So it, again, it's, um, I could probably write a paper on this, <laughs> an income certification uh, the range yesterday, I don't know, Carol, if you were in on the whole thing or any of the rest of you um, listened, but, you know, there's uh, one school of thought about make this as simple and straightforward and fast as possible because we're serving households in, um, in an emergency, you know, can't pay their rent. Um, the other uh, school of thought or another school of thought is, look, this is, this is public money. We have to be good stewards of these funds and we have to make sure we're, you know, being um, thoughtful and not, you know, not delaying, not taking three months to do some income certification, but by the same token, being, you know, being responsible about um, that. So I think there's kind of a, a fine line here and we just have to, you have to figure out how you get enough information without creating um, a huge amount of paperwork because if you were going to go in for a Section 8 certificate, I mean, you'd be getting all kinds of documentation. We're not, um, we're not thinking in, in those terms. Um, so, but, you know, it'd be good to hear any of your, your thoughts about this. My only, my only oh, sorry, Rob, go ahead. I would suggest um, making the first three months easy. Then for recertification, they, they have you have time to, to do a deeper dive mm -hmm. if, there, if there has to be more um, another extension or something. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's what this is. It. This is what I was going to suggest too. That you know we could do it with like really quick when they first apply, but giving them a certain amount of time to provide documentation, right, and then. If it proved that they had substantial, you know, um, savings or things like that, then they would be disqualified, and they may have to pay back some of the money. What, whatever language we, we should be on, but I think that definitely making it quick because there, there, there's definitely a lot of people out there in need. That's there has to be a system to make it quick and then get the documentation later if we can. Right. So I think there's a certain amount of documentation you want up front. Um, you know, things like knowing that their rent, they're, they're living in an apartment in, or a house, whatever, in, in Amherst, what the rent is, um, uh, documentation that their um, income has uh, changed, either they've lost their jobs and are not, we, you know, we would be counting unemployment. So, um, mm -hmm. so we'd have to, you know, that's, that's income so that they don't, what income do they have? Um, and do they, so do they fall underneath these limits? Rita, the only comment I had was, well, two of them. One was that I've seen where um, I was with someone getting SNAP benefits. Yep. They, they signed an affidavit, boom, that was it. Uh -huh. Maybe 20 minutes to, uh -huh. to get, the, uh, get the approval and get their card. Yep. Um, so if you put this all in, all of these conditions in the form of a affidavit that they signed that says, I swear that I have yeah. this much income, I have only this much assets, I have only this much, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then they sign it. And if it later proves not to be true, then they also have to sign that they owe that money back. Yeah. I think it's, another story. yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a happy medium, for, a, 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 not just a self-certification, but a little bit more than that. Um, and uh, well, make it simple. Uh, and I, I agree yeah. with uh, 
that said that, you know, make it easy for the first three months and then go forward. And the other comment I had was that I think a lot of this is going to hinge on who is the administrator or contractor of this. Yes. Their experience with this sort of stuff and they've done certifications for all yep. sorts of things that are very similar. They're going to know about fair housing. They're going to know about all of these restrictions and what the student you know, requirements are for you know, housing tax credits and and uh, you'll save a whole lot of time trying yeah. to design this because, you know, these assistance programs take years to develop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everybody is, is uh, yeah, high, high gear doing this. So, yeah, no, that's um, very good. And, and I think, you know, with the other document, uh, the next document we'll just take a look at is um, what the responsibility is of an administrator. But I think definitely... Um, the town doesn't want to be the administrator of this. We will have to go through through some sort of procurement process to um, to get an administrator, and absolutely having somebody who has that has experience um, in these kinds of things. I just want to um, butt in and say that Kevin's joined us as an attendee, and Janet McGowan has raised her hand. Tom, if you want to let her speak, I can I can acknowledge her in a minute. The um, yeah, Will, I just want to make sure that we answered your question clearly. So HUD updates income levels every uh, March, April, uh, and March and April every year. So the income limits that are shown here are the current income limits from 2020. So those have been updated, but then the income is based on, you know, a three month forecast, um, you know, starting in March or something. So, you know, we're not going to ask for um, payroll for 2019. We'd have households you know, base it on how they're impacted with, with COVID and what their earnings are now. And um, I was going to say, Tom, quickly for self-declarations for, for CDBG, if it's a presumed lower mod income population, you can self-declare. But if it's, I think what's difficult here is that so many different types of households will be impacted. Self-declaration gets a little fuzzy because, um, you know, anyone could could claim a hardship. And so, um, usually we'd ask for a little bit more documentation. I'm hoping that I agree that if we have a, an experienced administrator, if they, you know, if they're very familiar with it, they can set it up so that they can receive documents and it won't take very long. Um, but uh, usually we do want some type of documentation for income or, um, or loss of income or loss of income. Right. Um, I just want to say, I, I think the biggest challenge here is timing. I think, yeah. um, can we do a two week procurement, for instance? Can we do a, um, you know, a, a uh, certification in two weeks? I mean, I mean, it could be August before we were able to give out a single penny, you know? Yeah. I know that they're holding off on evictions in many cases, but not necessarily in the private sector. So, well, I think the new state law that was just passed does um, provide for, um, you know, holding uh, people harmless on evictions and um, foreclosures. So, um, it's you know we, we do have a little bit of time, but absolutely, I think there's an there's an interest in getting this underway because. Um, and John and Nate and I have been talking, and I know Nate's been uh, speaking with other folks within Town Hall um, about the procurement requirements. So um, if in this instance, the, um, what we're procuring is services and the um, assistance amount would not be services, it would not be included in that, in those procurement limits. So if um, the range for doing just three quotes is from $10,000 to $50,000 on procurement, once you're over $50,000, this is for goods and services, then you have to um, go through an RFQ, RFP process, which is a much longer, um, kind of more involved. So, you know, my sense is that if we're starting with just some funds from um, from the trust that we could, it's conceivable, we could get this underway with doing that, um, that shorter procurement, which just involves, um, 
it's, it's, you know, can be turned around relatively quickly. Great. Hey, Tom, I just want to mention that uh, Janet McGowan has her hand raised. Would you like to acknowledge her to speak? Um, well, um, <laughs> Paul and Carol also have their hands. Sure. Yeah, okay. We should stick with our uh, board first, okay? If Janet. Yep. That's fine, yep. Off a little bit. Carol, you were the first to have your hand raised. I Paul go. I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll remember yeah. it while we're talking. It's my background distracting, isn't it? Yes. That's it. <laughs> go ahead, Paul. Thank you. Um, so I, I, for Rita, I assume, I mean, other communities have, are already thinking about this. Someone's already invented the wheel. And I think it would make sense for us to just take the one that we think is best and move for move forward with it. I think the RFP for administering it should be pretty straightforward. It's just the design of the program uh, should be pretty vanilla, I think. And I know we want to craft it very narrowly, but I think that that's going to make it more and more complex. So I think the the benefit to us is speed and getting something simple and fast out the door as opposed to trying to carve the money to people who live in town with children who I think we're just going to tie ourselves up in the knots trying to hit all those marks. Um, I wouldn't make it much simpler than this. <laughs> and I, and you know, if you kind of go by the guidance that's been put out there, um, based on CPA, the CPA statute, as well as um, just, you know, what is good public policy. This pretty much follows it. I, I, I think there are other communities that have made it much more complex, but we have to do things like household income. We have to, you know, do some sort of income certification. To, um, and I think setting up some program guidelines because we don't want to you can't hand this off to an administrator who's making decisions um, that you know could come back to haunt everybody. Um, so this, these guidelines are um, uh, pretty straightforward um, and and conform. I, I think there's uh, the difference, and, and nobody's really that far ahead of us, honestly. Um, Boston had its own program, which it kind of went off, and they had a lot of requirements. I'm really curious about how um, uh, they put $3 million up um, to get a program started. The only other program that's operating right now is um, out in Lenox and Great Barrington, and they haven't been very responsive to either, to either me or John about how they did things, but everybody else is just talking about this. Um, Hasn't Quiz, Quincy done stuff? Um, they might have done stuff, but I don't know that they have a program operating. And I'm not sure if they're using CPA funds either. I want to let Carol speak and then um, I want to let Rita finish with her presentation um, just in interest of uh, closing out the time and, and then we'll recognize Janet. All right, I did one, <clears throat> one quick qu <clears throat> quick comment, which was that in the scene yesterday, they, they had a draft that looked much like this actually, Western Mass, something or other, had something was being used by several towns it looked very like this. And the town that was the quickest, that was really on top of everything, thought they'd get started by July 1st, Newton. So <clears throat> just as a, a vague timeline of, of what seemed to be possible. And my other questions will probably come up when Rita talks some more, so I'll wait. <clears throat> yeah, I just want to say quickly, um, there's, you know, there's a, it's a multi-step process. So the town has to procure an administrator and through the mass housing partnership workshop, you know, it's clear that you want, you know, you want to get an, you know, an experienced administrator. And I think the program guidelines help provide, you know, the framework on how the administrator would, would uh, go through the program. The other one is um, more than likely we'll have to run a lottery for people applying for this assistance. It would be really difficult to do a first come first serve basis and um, you know we might might run afoul of fair housing um, law, you know laws and regulations, and so that's something else to consider. You know, we I, I always thought we could try to get this going before July one because the trust has money in in the bank account now, so it doesn't take a town council vote to authorize or allocate the money. It's already there. Um, 
it takes you know some you know the trust to authorize it and then the town to go through some steps uh, it will still take some time and then if there's a lottery not that that takes a little bit more time but you know we may have enough funding say for 100 households and we may have hundreds of households that apply and so we have to consider how to you know how to be equitable in that distribution of funds because we don't have enough to help everyone and if we're have a target number of households and we want to do it for three months or six months, um, you know, we have to be careful in terms of how much money we have and how many households we can help. So just wanted to say that quickly. Thanks. <clears throat> do you want to scroll on there? Um, sure, we can. Uh, this is probably important. Oh, I think there was another question, right? From, did you want to? Um, no, I don't think okay. so. I think All we right. want to hear your your uh, wrap up here. Okay. Um, so uh, this was a little bit of just uh, thinking through what what are rents in Amherst, assuming we're not going to be able to cover. We're, you know, we're trying to reach as many people, make a difference to as many people as as possible, but not expend all the funds on just a small number of households. So um, thinking through kind of what, it, you know, what are the current, you know, what are the, the rents, um, they came up with this maximum subsidy amount and it was not, um, it's not I, I have to say it wasn't scientific, it was more kind of knowing, uh, it just guessing sort of what, what are the rents out there. And um, these certainly, these numbers could be revised, we are talking about um, three months. And, uh, you know, one decision that would have to be made is, is that would that be retroactive? Or is that um, just going forward? Some communities are talking about doing it retroactively. Um, so um, kind of based on everybody's knowledge, do, does this seem like the right amount of money? So for people, if they can't see it, you know, we're, uh, you know, it's the subsidy would be a maximum of five hundred dollars for an efficiency or one bedroom, six fifty for a two bedroom, and eight hundred fifty a month for a three or you know three bedroom or greater, and you know that's that's a maximum amount. And the um, just so you know, in the case of. Um, the subsidy, it has to go directly, then this is a CPA requirement, it goes directly to the landlord. It does not go to the, the household. And there will be either an addendum, if there's an existing lease, there can be an addendum to the lease, or there's a contract, um, essentially a, a grant agreement between the administrator and the um, landlord to pay X number of dollars per month for three months um, on behalf of X tenant. So we already do have kind of um, templates for um, that agreement. I just need to do a little bit more work on it. But So in terms of the numbers, Rita, this is 2,550 is the maximum for three months for a three bedroom plus a house uh, mm -hmm. apartment. So if you had say $400,000 available, um, assuming $200,000 from the trust and $200,000 from the CPA, then we would have uh, approximately, um, I don't know, 150 or more uh, households. Yeah, okay, do the math. <laughs> yeah. For three months, you wouldn't Yeah, have three months, months right. That's the max. So maybe you could serve 200 households. Carol, you had your hand up? I, one of the things that, that it suggests in one of these other things is to work with the landlord to see if there's any possibility of, hey, if we're going to do this, can you do something too? Can you reduce the rent a little bit for this period of time since we're going to be subsidizing it? So that might make some difference. And, and my only comment about the amounts, because I don't know, is it needs to be enough so it really does let the person stay there and they don't end up not being able to pay whatever their part of it is and they're still in danger of being kicked out. That would be horrible if we do all this and then we still haven't provided people uh, a place to live. So 
I don't know how to figure out those numbers. I would like to be able to kind of get some more information about what would what would it what will it really take to make it so that the people that get the subsidies really do get to stay there without without just make it more make sure that we're really making it possible for people to stay there with the amounts of money. So the the state law that was um, just passed uh, was just signed by the governor this week. You know, does provide a lot of protections for. Um, uh, vis-a-vis -vis eviction, and there are two dates. Um, it's uh, the uh, the shorter of it. It it stops any evictions for um, during the state of emergency, and um, I think it's 120 days beyond the. And oh, by 120 days from the signing of the of the law, or 45 days after the state of emergency is lifted, so there cannot be any evictions, and um, so if people are not paying the rent; they can't be evicted. Um, what does happen is, you know, the household is still responsible for having, you know, for for paying. It's just the same with the mortgage, with you know the the freeze on foreclosures you're still going to be owing that that money. So yeah, this is a short term. I mean, what what this does is uh, it doesn't it doesn't solve all the problems for the lack of income. And I think we, um, you know, in looking for an administrator, need to be thinking about what other kinds of services um, that administrator provides, you know, to really assist the families. As far as negotiating the rents with the, um, you know, asking for a reduction in rent, um, I'm not sure that's, uh, that's a lot to ask of the administrator. I think, you know, that would be a whole other um, uh, addition to well, the services that could could complicate and slow things down. Well, Rita, let me just ask you. So it shows the maximum amount of the rent. Is that the maximum amount of the of the subsidy calculation, or is that's that a subsidy dollar? That's not the rent. Okay, so the rent could be significantly higher. Yes. Than the yes. units that you have there. It be, but, yes. But our subsidy would yeah, and in fact, you know, for a three-bedroom unit, you could have somebody paying twenty-five hundred dollars a month now. Right. 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 We could do some sort of rent reasonableness uh, test, I guess. Um, but that gets pretty mm -hmm. um, tricky. Again, it, that gets more complex. And as Paul's pointing out, you know, we're trying, we're trying to kind of keep this as, um, uh, as basic as possible, um, but still not being, um, not being irresponsible. So that's the, again, that kind of fine line we're trying to walk here. I think, um, Carol, just to your point about forgiveness, I mean, that's something that has been, you know, staff has also discussed, is there, you know, is there a possibility of asking some landlords to, you know, either forgive rent or have a reduced rent? And, you know, I agree with Rita that that's something that necessarily wouldn't fall. I, I wouldn't ask it of the administrator. I think it's beyond, you know, uh, just administering a, you know, a rental assistance program. But, you know, I think it's a good point. I think, um, you know, we're calling this kind of a, like a gap funding. And, you know, we don't have, you know, $400,000 sounds like a lot. But if you you know, the rents in Amherst are quite high. And, you know, if we want to help a number of households, it, it, it will go fast. Um, yeah. But I think it's a good point. Yeah, I want to make sure, it would, I'd like to know that the money we're providing to households that they're staying in their unit, right? Yeah, I, I yes. would feel so sad that we would help a household and then they still face eviction after mm -hmm. they receive our payments. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. In the interest of time, I just want to ask Rita to, to finish your presentation. Sure. Um, can you just scroll up uh, again, just to make sure I did I cover everything up there. Um, selection process. I didn't put the lottery in here, but I was pretty convinced after listening to that presentation 
um, yesterday that uh, that we would definitely do a lottery because I think that there's going to be a really big demand. We don't want to have happen what happened with the um, the small business loan program from the feds, which was, you know, a bunch of the high rollers got the money, got in there first and, and ate it all up. So this way, you know, having a, a lottery is just a fair, fair way, give people an equal footing, get, get the applications in, um, probably, you know, release the money in, in two, um, in two phases so that if somebody missed out in the first um, phase that they would uh, you know there'd be a second application period because I do worry that information doesn't get out there and even though we'll, it will be marketed um, so the least we have kind of already talked about that are some alternate documentation the program administrator um, 30b and then the role and responsibility kind of they would have um, they would do everything from marketing intake, application review, um, and then be reporting back to the town. And then there is a separate document that um, we can go over if we want to skip to, to Kevin um, and then go over that, or if you just want to give me comments. Um, the one thing I do want to just mention because um, uh, it, it relates to um, what we've been talking about with landlords. So Nancy Schroeder, who um, has resigned from the trust, unfortunately, but is still very interested in, in doing some work with the trust, um, actually did a, did a survey of, of landlords um, and had sent out some of the basic parameters of a rental assistance program, the stuff that MHP had prepared. And she got two responses, one from Roland Green and one from, um, Caymans from from Pat Caymans and um, not unsurprisingly well I was a little bit surprised their their immediate concern is about students who have moved out and are not paying their rent and are not planning on paying their rent so those are a couple of big landlords uh, and uh, even when stuff has been co-signed I guess by parents they're saying we can't pay so uh, it's it's not only going to be um, they're not only facing um, you know families and households where there's been a job loss but all the students moving out and just walking away and saying we're not paying we're not there we're not going to pay the rent um, so she's she's gonna keep um, and, and talk to some more um, landlords but this uh, this pandemic really just shaken the whole world up. Yeah. Yeah, so like there quickly, um, you know, I think Rita gave a good overview. The one thing we hadn't mentioned is that most administrators will charge, you know, a percentage cost for their, you know, a fee. So, yeah. you know, um, Rita and John have talked to a few people, you know, and through, you know, I mean, it could be anywhere from 20 to 30%. So, you know, if we're saying that we have, you know, $400,000 in, and, and subsidy, you know, it may be that, you know, their fee is $80,000. And, you know, so I think, you know, the discussion has to be, you know, would we um, in our program guidelines or in our procurement uh, have a cap, you know, a percentage cap? And, you know, what, what do we think is reasonable? Um, you know, we're hoping to have get an administrator who has staff and the capacity to, to really work with, work with the town um, you know, Valley CDC, when they did their small business program uh, in Northampton, they, they actually hired someone part-time just to help with all the applications and intake. So it may be that, you know, we don't necessarily want to be supporting a lot of overhead for an administrator, but there are, you know, this is pretty, um, can be time intensive and, and, you know, it takes a lot of effort to do all the paperwork and process everything. So, you know, just, you know, so people are aware that, you know, there's the rental amount, the subsidies, and there's a program fee that, you know, is built into this. And that's what we'll be procuring is the program fee. So if we think that, you know, it's going to be over 50,000, it's one type of procurement. If it's under 50,000, it's something, it's, you know, a quote process. Um, but I think if we are anticipating, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars in subsidy, then, you know, it'll be a fair amount of an administrative fee. Well, I think that the $50,000 limit uh, as a good one, 
uh, I think just because of the procurement issues and you know, it may be that that's not enough, um, but if you go over 50,000, it's a lot longer process and it'd be better if we could avoid that. I will say that, you know, for a short term project like this, this is huge investment for any agency to get involved in. And Can you say that again, Tom? I kind of missed what you said. I think it's, it's a lot of investment for any agency yeah. to get involved in, in setting up a whole new program for just couple of months, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of work and they're not going to get a lot in the long run. So you might have a real challenge in attracting people to come in, but hopefully 50,000 will be enough. Yeah. So another uh, reason for keeping it simple. Yeah. <laughs> and we have been, um, uh, John and I have been just, um, kind of scouting it out with some organizations just, uh, uh, kind of run by the basics and see whether or not there's there's definitely interest out there so and I think um, and and there are organizations that do have um, that have done similar you know do check writing to kind of administration where we could plug in without a whole lot of um, I think the intake and the application review will be um, new but there's certainly there's certainly some experience out there, which was encouraging. So I think we could find somebody. Okay. All right. So we wanted to, oh, Carol, just, we, we wanted to let Janet have a come. We, yeah, go ahead. Please do. Let her. Sure. I'll, uh, Janet, you are unmuted if you can hear me. I think we had her waiting so long. She's. Can you hear me now? Oh. Yes. Okay. So actually my comment, was um, basically the idea that um, Carol and Nate and the town staff have been talking about in terms of talking to landlords about reducing their rents and um, because that would stretch your dollars, obviously. Um, UMass and Amherst College may be virtual in the fall or partially vir virtual. I was talking to someone from Amherst College and they might only bring some students back on campus because um, they're looking at maybe having only one student per dorm room and things like that. And so I think that really will shift the landscape for landlords from having a very low vacancy rate to maybe really scrambling for tenants. And that might be an opportunity for landlords to, tempor to agree to tempor temporarily um, reduce rents. And I'm not sure who would ask that or what you know the next step would be, but I think it would be an incentive to landlords you know, to get you know, 80% of your rent or 60% versus um, having people not able to pay. And then, you know, if you can't pay for three or four months and you get a job, you, it's going to be difficult for people to make up that back rent. And then it's difficult to go get that money out of people through, you know, a legal process. So I think maybe kind of in a esprit de corps or just, you know, hard facts that landlords would start reducing rents or the town could ask them or I don't know if you would have mediators work with people or how that program would be set up, but I think it's a viable idea to um, ask people to reduce rents until the crisis is over. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. Um, so discussion. Um, I think we have had a lot of discussion as we went through all of this. Um, I think what John was looking for was a a vote to move forward with this and to give John and Nate and Rita um, approval to proceed with this program and uh, try to, to finalize it. And um, I don't know if uh, we're ready for a motion, but um, I would entertain one if there was one. Carol. It isn't a motion, it's just a point of clarification, I think. You have said there's $400,000 here. I would like to be sort of clear in any way that we do this about what money we're saying we're willing to use and how much it is and where it is. And I just yeah. think that should be part of whatever we say. Sure, I think I can answer that. So the trust, um, I don't think has 400,000. You know, originally John would have liked the trust to um, put in 200,000 and then for CPA to try to um, vote and you know recommend another 200,000 for town council um, you know what I've heard is that they're 
there is no CPA money that's that is available at least until after July one, and there's some you know caution about how soon after July one that would be available. So really, all that's available is what's in the trust fund right now, and you know there's probably about three hundred thousand dollars that could be put to this um, right now, and that's from you know that's all you know that's the trust money that has been. Um, you know, some has been donated and most of it's CPA money. So it's really what is available in the trust right now. But John was, um, I wouldn't say he was confident, but he was- um, uh, Hopeful. He was hopeful, thank you. <laughs> there would be more uh, CPA money. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you. So I think the trust can only act on funds that it possesses. It can't, you can't right. put on hope. Um, uh, so I think, I mean, the action should be what the trust is doing versus what somebody else might be contributing. Sure, but I, I think we can say that we encourage uh, the, uh, the team here to seek additional funds from the CPA or wherever, um, and that uh, we would be willing to commit up to um, 300,000. Um, I think that's a lot. I would have limited it to 200, but that's just my vote. Um, so is there any other considerations before we? Can I, I'm it's a uh, budgetary question, but I have a budget thing that I thought it's from the end of last year, but I thought it told me how much the trust had and it was or more like almost five hundred thousand dollars. I don't necessarily want to spend it all, but I just could we get some updated thing about where so we can see the same number. Not right this minute, but at some point, Nate, whatever, so we can see what you're sure I can send that. That be accurate. I mean, some of the money for CPA was voted for um, consultants or specific things, and then some of it was for general development or you know just capitalization of the trust. So, you know, about seventy thousand has been. Um, was allocated and voted for consultants or specific things. So that money can't necessarily be used for rental assistance. Uh -huh. um, Got it. Thank you. And I, um, yeah, one thing I was going to say, uh, Tom, you know, um, you know, if the trust is ready to vote now, I mean, I could, you know, I would, I, I'd, you know, say we could meet next week, even if that gives everyone enough time to read documents, if they're not comfortable voting tonight, you know, we don't, I'll just say, you know, if people are comfortable, if members are comfortable, we don't have to wait. A month, but if people don't want to vote tonight, you know, if there if people want to meet in a week just to just to have this as as an agenda item, we could if that's you know reasonable for people. I just want to mention that as an option, just in case people aren't to vote tonight. Well, um, does anybody want to offer a motion? I I would offer the motion that we continue to develop this idea. It's a good idea and we should continue to develop it. We will approve it in some fashion. I, or I haven't been turning into a motion, but we would like to pursue this with the intent of approving something soon, even though it's not all worked out yet. So we don't want to approve it exactly how it is. So Does that this, make any sense? <laughs> so it's a motion to move forward with the planning for this program um, without any specific approval of the particulars that uh, being worked on. Um, are there any reservations about what we have seen so far? Does anybody want to say, don't do this or you must do that um, uh, as guidance to the team doing this? Okay. Yeah, I guess, Carol, I'm not sure based on what we've talked about so far, what other changes are being looked for, what further, I mean, there's some things that would be tweaked, but they might be tweaked once we have an administrator. But in terms of the program design, um, Is you it, know, I, I, just I, like some guidance, I got, I got the sense that this was not the final draft, uh, but is it really in a final draft? Well, it, it's a, you know, the it, it, incorporating the lottery in there. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't hear that much more tonight that would lead me to 
um, editing this heavily. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I guess we could leave that option open of people providing comments, and then if the um, if the trust is going to meet again, come back with an edited version. But uh, okay, I, I I didn't realize that we were that far along. Carol, you had a comment? And then Paul? I only would just say the things that seem left, the things that I'm unclear about are, I hope maybe we could get a little more clarity on whether these amounts of money that would be the, uh, the subsidy amounts really are going to do what we want them to do and get some clarity, yes, on something or other about uh, um, lottery, at least that we do want to use a lottery. I would hope that would be part of what, what we ask from an administrator. And some idea, hopefully, of, yes, let's try and keep the amount, the request to be less than $50,000 or have a very good reason why it's got to be more. And maybe in the course of figuring that out, we could check with some of the people who are already trying to do this to see what seems reasonable to other people. So it just seems like there's maybe a little more research in a few places that could go into it. The basic outline of the thing is great, but that's why it seems hard right now to vote on it to me because there are these things that just aren't really quite all the way there. It's a good idea. All the parts of it are a good idea, but that for me, those are the things that stand out. So, um, okay, so Carol had made a motion that we proceed and uh, have it further developed by Rita and Nate and John and whoever else uh, and town staff. Paul, you, you had a comment, I'm sorry. Actually, I, I'll just support Carol's motion with the with the understanding that a, a firm dollar sum would be at attached to whatever the next the next time we look at it, what that look what that dollar amount is. Okay. So we want to confirm the uh, the addition of the lottery. We want to confirm that the um, the bid amount will be less than fifty thousand set at less than fifty thousand. We want to confirm the amount of the commitment from. Uh, uh, the trust, and I would say, and whether we make that contingent upon commitment of other funds from others, whether there's any kind of additional leveraging, um, maybe not, but uh, I thought I heard John say that he was counting on some additional money. He wasn't just going to do this solely with uh, with trust funds. So that would be a, another issue. Paul? So I wouldn't say it's contingent on other funds. I would say with the prospect of securing other funds. I mean, if CPA doesn't act or the council doesn't act, it doesn't prevent the trust from moving forward on this with the money that we have. Well, I guess I just, I, I don't know whether that's that's something that uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to relay what I had heard from John and he seemed pretty certain that this wasn't gonna work unless there was other funds and it couldn't solely be CPA, but it was a very brief conversation, so I may have uh, maybe misspeaking. You know, I think um, quickly to that, you know, we can't um, award a contract on uh, funds that aren't even, you know, allocated. So, you know, to that point, the trust has money. You know, if we said 300000 that's the amount. Um, you know, I can send an updated budget. Um, and then really the procurement or the 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 services would be would be based on that amount. And if CPA um, votes or recommends and town council votes later this year, you know, we have a second phase that may be um, procured and implemented in the fall, but we can't, you know, I wouldn't want to wait until the CPA process because that might not be until September, right? If the state's slow getting money out. So I think the trust has the ability to um, move forward now. It may not be exactly how John wanted it, you know, say we have this large pot of money, but I think the timing is such that we don't necessarily don't want to wait for CPA to be able to make a contract award. I understand the timing issue. I just, yeah. you know, there's limited amount of money and sometimes using your money to leverage other money is a, is a good uh, strategy. Okay, so um, we want to see 
confirmation of the lottery, the bid amount less than 50,000, an amount of trust money to be committed. And was there anything else we wanted to make sure? I thought Kayla had a point of, you know, are the amounts sufficient to keep households in their unit? So I think, right. I, you know, I, you know, I, I we can guarantee that Carol. I, I I, yeah. How, I don't, I don't see how we can guarantee that. I know, I'm, yeah, you can't guarantee it. There's no way to guarantee it, but you could have, I, you could have some idea of how many, if people are paying 35%, what is this thing? They're supposed to pay 35% of their income and you're going to pay as, as much as 500 to try to make out the difference. Is there any way to have any idea how much, how, in what number of circumstances the 500 will make up the difference as opposed to there still being a gap? We have no idea. I mean, okay, I, don't know. I mean, so I would imagine that there may be people for whom the five hundred dollars. So let's say you're in a place and it's a thousand dollars a month, and the uh, the subsidy, and you have no income at all, right. and uh, you know, so it's zero. So thirty five percent of zero is zero. Um, and so they the if it's uh, in a it's, is it 500 for an efficiency or one bedroom? One, one, efficiency and one bedroom. And one bedroom. So, so you've got a one bedroom unit. It's costing you a thousand, but all you're going to get from the trust is $500. And if you don't have the other $500 to pay, um, you're going to be that far behind. But, um, you know, I don't know that there's anything more that, that we could say. Um, Maybe the maybe the issue is in the in the uh, agreement that is between the person and the landlord and the administrator that says, if I get this money for these months, this person can. I mean, they can't get kicked out now anyway because they can't be evicted because of the law. It's a tough situation, Carol. I mean, we're yes. we're stuck. That's, yeah. no question about that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Carol, I mean, to, to extend your ideas, like, would we, would the landlords be willing if we said in the tri-party agreement that you can't evict someone, um, you know, through 2020, or we anticipate a deadline if the state of emergency ends in the fall, you know, I mean, I'm not sure if they'd be willing to do that, but I mean, my thought is that's the only way is if we to factor in something into this agreement, but, um, you know, I'm not sure who would be willing to sign it. Uh, no, I don't, I don't really don't want to make it more complicated and maybe it's just my lack of information that makes me slightly uncomfortable with these numbers but we're going to look at it again and so that's fine so maybe we can talk to a couple of more landlords john page had a question i was just going to read the motion as i think where it's fallen Okay. Uh, vote to empower staff to develop and present a final draft of a program design for an emergency subsidy program that includes selection by lottery, lottery a procurement cost limit of $50,000, and a discrete amount of trust funds to be allocated. Is that accurate? Sounds good. Okay, Carol. Okay. Do we have a second? Anyone? Second. Rob. Rob is seconding it. All, um, any discussion? Any further discussion? All in favor? I would do the roll call, Tom. Oh, roll call. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, Carol. Hi. Rob. Hi. Will. Aye. Paul. Aye. Did. Aye. And I do too. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Okay. Can we get the agenda back? Thank you. So Kevin Noonan is uh is an attendee. Oh, we could yes. have him speak now if we'd like. Sure. Uh, sure. That's fine with me. All right, Kevin. I'm going to uh, allow you to talk. I think you can. Uh, you're all set. You can also video yourself in if you'd like. Can, I, can you hear me now? I can hear, yes. Okay. So uh, 
sorry, I'm late to the meeting. What, what is the question that you, you wanted an update on the shelter? I guess, uh, right, uh, John had uh, heard, I thought, did he ask you or you asked him? To... Yeah, he asked me and, I, and it's so long ago now because there were some, we were originally gonna do this in March and then, sure. so I'm not 100% sure, but I, I assume it was an update on where the shelter is, but maybe sure. more. And, and he had mentioned to me, there was some discussion about trying to extend the closing date, but uh, I may have- Well, that, yeah, back then there probably, I mean, sorry, more recently there was, but not now, no. Because now we're, we're about, we're, so that's a good segue. We're about to test the entire shelter uh, population at Craig's Place in the basement of the Baptist Church and the staff that have been working with those people uh, in the basement of the church. And um, so that's going to take place on Tuesday. And then based on that, once, once the results are back to us, there will be two options. If someone is COVID positive, they will be offered a motel funded by the state and handled by MEMA, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. And there is a MEMA funded hotel at the Quality Inn in Northampton. But coincidentally, the same day that we're testing, Northampton is testing that afternoon at the Northampton High School and they have 58 beds there. So it would also be possible that uh, uh, people will have to travel to Pittsfield or uh, I believe Lexington was another place where there are motels that are funded for people who are homeless, uh, but are COVID positive. For those who are just exposed to those positive cases, the town has a, a brokered a deal, which I think was in the, uh, the Hampshire Gazette in earlier this month with Hampshire College. And um, <clears throat> so we're going to immediately close Craig's place maybe a day or two early, but once we have those results, we'll close the shelter and transfer the operation down to the Hampshire College uh, Dakin dorm. And then we will, uh, we will function from there as a quarantine site, not as a shelter. Okay. So we're really pleased that the town has been able to do this because uh, you know, this has been a problem. There, there's an important statistic that I probably should have prefaced this all with that uh, Pine Street Inn in Boston last week checked, um, I believe it was just under 400 people in the shelter and 126 of those were COVID positive mm. and 100% of the COVID positive cases were asymptomatic. Mm. So this suggests that the, the screening that we've been doing and other shelters have been doing throughout the state, throughout the country is not really helpful. It's we're screening for temperature. We're asking questions about do you have a cough? Well, do you have, we listen for a cough or we ask them if they've been around anybody who was COVID positive. Right. None of those screening tools are really uh, helpful in identifying who's COVID positive. So the tests, which will be done by Dr. Bossy from Healthcare for the Homeless, these should be more definitive. And so, unfortunately, it'll look like a spike in, in COVID positive cases among the homeless population, but it's really more linked to the fact that we have wow. testing now. Wow. And that's why we have the testing, because when the Boston results came out, there was a statewide push to and not just a statewide, a countrywide push to to get the testing into the shelters. Okay. Wow. Thanks, Kevin. Was there You're anything else that you wanted to report? No, I, I just thank you for what you were just talking about. That's that's a very positive thing, and um, and uh, obviously more money for housing is is key, especially in a town like Amherst where the rents are so high. Um, Normally at this time we'd be trying to get people in their housing, you know, as fast as possible, but we don't know what the results of the tests are going to be on Tuesday. So we're sort of in a whole holding pattern. Kevin, this is Nate. Did you, can you mention how many people are in the shelter now? I don't know if you did. Yeah, we, we're full every night. Um, the problem is everybody, there was a lot of consolidation. There was a, uh, what was called a warming center operating out of the old, uh, out of the Salvation Army in Greenfield that got closed and consolidated with the Well Street shelter in Greenfield. Mm -hmm. Then there was the closure of um, Grove Street Inn in Northampton, as well as the Cot shelter in Northampton. And they were consolidated into the um, Northampton High School. And I believe the East Hampton overflow shelter was closed as well. So with this consolidation, there's fewer and fewer beds. So we're getting calls from throughout the county and beyond uh, to, you know, do you have a bed? And we, our standard answer is, 
anybody who had a bed last night gets the bed tonight if they show up at 930. So you're, you're sort of taking your chances if you come up here and you don't have an option B. Right. And that's usually enough to dissuade people from coming all the way up to Amherst if they're calling, say, from Holyoke or Springfield. But uh, uh, when, when all is said and done, we try to deal with what's on the doorstep at 9.30 at night. Yeah. Paul, you had a comment? Yeah, a couple of things. So I just want to first thank Craig Storrs, specifically Kevin, for providing the lead on this, especially with the testing. I think that's a critical component even though the, the shelter is scheduled to close on April 30th, it's really important for all these congregate uh, shelters. And it's not just homeless, it's also any place where there's con congregate housing, like senior centers um, and you know the soldiers, some all these different places. When you live in a congregate setting like that, the, uh, the likelihood of spread is very easy. So I think that this is a really good thing. He, he just, uh, Kevin described it perfectly. The second thing I want to just, I just want to throw a shout out to uh, Hampshire College for opening up their dorms for this. Um, you know, I, I've been talking with the president there about a contract. Uh, I put in a section for how much do you want us to pay you for this? And he just crossed out the entire section for pay. Uh, and it's really a real commitment on their part uh, to, to our community, I think. So um, I, I am an alum, so I full disclosure, but I do think this is something that at a moment when we really needed support, they stepped forward and they are have been saying, let's go, let's go every step of the way. So just want to thank them for that too. Thank you, Paul. That sounds great. Anything else, Kevin? Well, no, I mean, I just want to echo what Paul said. That's something that uh, we, we're really happy too, that Hampshire College stepped up to the plate and, um, and I'm, we're looking forward to hanging out on their campus uh, as of Wednesday, possibly. And uh, we appreciate the fact that Paul was able to put it together. I don't know if it matters that he was a, a alum, but it probably didn't hurt. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's a really bucolic setting down there. I forgot, I mean, I've been there many times, but I just haven't been there recently. And now with the, uh, the stay-at-home order, it's so quiet. Uh, it's a really beautiful setting. So uh, we're looking forward. And I think some of the people are kind of, some of the news is trickling out and they're hearing, what, I get my own room and a bed and a door, which is, the whole reason we called this place Craig's Doors is because yeah, people yeah. who are homeless don't have a door. So we really appreciate what the town has done. Okay, any other questions or comments for Kevin? Okay, thanks Kevin. Appreciate Thank it. you, Tom, I appreciate Thank it. you for all your work. All right, uh, if it's okay, I'll sign off because I gotta get busy on a budget for the town here. Okay. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so the next items were the East Street School Assessments and Strong Street, Hickory Ridge, UMass. Um, uh, I don't know, do we have information on any of these? Um, I don't um, have any individual information. Does anyone? I can um, say that on A and B there isn't much. You know, we're still, um, I had reached out to Wetland Consultants and I plan to do that again soon. So, you know, that had stopped, um, you know, over the winter and I reached out to, you know, three of them and they were interested in, we said we check back, however, with the, you know, with the health crisis, I'm not sure, um, you know, outside work may be okay on site, but nothing, you know, East Street School, we wanted someone to come in and do, you know, hazardous materials um, in the building, which isn't happening. Um, I think it was, um, um, Accutech or a company had been doing, you know, annual surveys of just a few places on East Street School, and I've been asking them if they could dig through their files to see if they actually did a full report. And, um, you know, I emailed them a, a while ago when we've been going back and forth every few weeks, and they're still looking, but they haven't found anything. I, I was hoping it would be as easy as, you know, here it is on our server, but uh, uh, nothing there. You know, so that's it on A and B. Okay. Anything on Hickory Ridge? Uh, I don't have anything. You have anything, Paul? Yeah, still in negotiations with the owners there. Um, you know, they continue to evaluate the land and uh, different aspects of it, so that no deal has done, been done with that yet. Are you expecting that this uh, crisis is with uh, financial implications could affect this uh, negotiation? Uh, it doesn't affect the negotiations, but it may affect what the count, if the council wants to continue moving forward on this or not. 
Okay. I think what I heard from John just briefly was that uh, um, maybe some of that money that we have, that would make a difference. If there was if there was a set aside of some land for affordable housing, that was part of that uh, acquisition and some of the trust money. So um, obviously the, the whole committee will have to have that conversation, but um, do people understand what is going on there? There's a large parcel of land that um, is a discussion and the town is possibly going to acquire it and some of that land could be made available for affordable housing. And that's something we'd be very interested in. So do you think there's anything coming up, any votes, any conversation formally? Uh, there are no votes, um, you know, with any, it's a property transaction. So you, you've all been involved in a property transaction. There are a lot of details and things that pop up in, in the course of negotiating a piece of property for sale. So just working through a month, number of those different things, environmental assessments, things like that. I see. I see. All right, we'll keep us posted. Um, UMass Residential Development, John had sent out a um, notes on conversations he was having with Tony and um, Tony Maroulis. Yeah, they're right here. I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't really have much to say either. I think it was just, you know, just to see how the, you know, the whole North Village and um, Lincoln Ave is going. Mm -hmm. The, I did notice, I did read through it, and John had pushed back on his unwillingness to define what they meant by um, affordability. Uh, they had stated in their statements that they, affordability was going to be important in North Village. And when he said, well, what do you mean by affordability? Um, he basically came back and said, well, you know, we don't have to make them affordable. Um, so, kind of skirted the issue, I thought. But anybody else had any reaction to that? Yeah, I think that's tough because, um, you know, it seems like there will be no public subsidy, right? So, um, there may not be, you know, tax credit funding or things that would, you know, require affordability. So, I, I you know, I think that's... I, I, yeah, I think it's, I'm glad John's just staying on top of that just because, you know, maybe be by virtue of their, of their, um, their condition, you know, the apartments were, were, you know, a lower rent. Um, but, you know, if they're, if these are all brand new units, you know, is there going to be, you know, John showed us kind of the prospectus that they were, they put online, is there going to be a push to have much more expensive rental units? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't look very encouraging. And I don't know if there's anything we want to do to try to apply any pressure. Um, I know the relationship with UMass um, doesn't give us a huge amount of leverage, but uh, I have to defer to others who've been involved in this over the years. Paul, is there any point in us trying to make any <laughs> Any overture to the university to pressure them to better define what they mean by affordability and what their commitment is to affordability in these new units? Um, I'm always for pressuring the university to do more on everything. So it's up to the trust to uh, advocate for that. I think it's, um, I, always, I always feel there can, there can be more done on these issues. Okay. All right, so uh, we will continue to press. Um, I had actually wondered if um, we could bring Tony and, and whoever else, maybe somebody more senior here at UMass, to come before the committee and maybe even a joint uh, town council and uh, housing committee meeting. Although now that we're doing this all virtually, I don't know that it has the same effect, but actually just have them come and tell us, you know, directly and, and face questions. Uh, is that is there a precedent for that Paul asking them to come and speak to the council and oh I, I think it's perfectly uh, reasonable to ask Tony Morales to come that's sort of his job um, 
I don't think you'd see it. The council is just going to be swamped with budget issues over the next two months. I don't think you'll see them able to take this anything like this on at this point in time. All right. Okay. Um, well, then let me ask. So, um, would anybody like to suggest that we invite Tony? Um, I think John sort of did that, and all he got was the answer. Um, yeah, there was there was last meeting we had. We we suggested that, and they they were supposed to come to the following meeting, right. and since it never happened, I guess that's why yeah. John put this these questions together for for Tony and and uh, and Nancy Nancy Oberfone. So okay, but well, we could have, could have them virtually. I'm pretty sure if John invited them. Yeah, Nancy I don't know not. that there's a vote necessarily, but Nate maybe. Um, we should go back to John and tell him that the sense of the meeting was that we'd really like to keep pressuring them to uh, to answer the question about affordability and, if possible, get them to come. I guess to the extent we can do it in person, virtually. Um, yeah, no, I think yeah, we can. I can relay that to John, and you know, he he can extend an invitation for the next meeting too. I think that. Yeah. We'd really, the folks would really like to hear them and, and ask questions. Sure. Okay. All right, next item. Was uh, Northampton Road. Is there anyone from Valley uh, in the audience? No, I thought Laura, maybe I said she was gonna make it, but um, I can give an update. You know, they, um, Valley received their um, project eligibility approval, uh, which means that, you know, they can submit their comprehensive permit when they're ready. Mm -hmm. And they've indicated to the town that they're trying to get it in. It'll probably be in early May. So they are, you know, they're still moving forward with their architects and engineers and they're, they're hoping to submit a comprehensive permit um, by the end of May or um, by early May. Um, you know, the meetings will probably be held virtually. And, you know, typically a comprehensive permit a lot, um, requires an expedited permitting process. So the hearing has to be opened within, um, 30 days. So this, you know, with the state orders, we have some flexibility. So we're going to, you know, ask for a, a bit of an extension from that 30 days, just so we can allow material to get online and be able to, um, you know, have a, a zoom meeting essentially in a way that if a lot of public are interested, we can have material available. So, you know, we've been talking to Valley about that, but they're, they're still hoping that they can, you know, apply um, for a comprehensive permit, go through the permitting this year, and then still have, you know, if all the, you know, the way the tax credits and funding work, you know, be ready for fall, winter to apply for, you know, funding. But, you know, so they're hoping for permitting this year. Yeah. Just one comment. I know that the governor's order says that um, 45 days after the lifting of the emergency restrictions are when uh, the public process can proceed. So um, if they submit something, you know, the day that the um, uh, the emergency order is lifted, the earliest there could be a hearing would be 45 days as far as yeah. that's my interpretation. But. Okay, legislative issues. I'm not sure what I meant by this. Does anybody have any comments or I'm not sure why he brought that up. Okay. 40 R district, any news on that? Yes, I think the, um, you know, the consultants had planned to come out and give a final presentation to, um, you know, the planning board and have a public meeting. The, um, you know, then with the, the health crisis, it's been postponed. We are looking at having them come back either on May 6th or May 20th to the planning board. Um, and then, you know, what's nice about the, we're, the idea is to use the planning board as the, as the public meeting because it's um, broadcast live, and, you know, through Amherst Media, and then it's also a virtual meeting through Zoom. So the idea is to have the consultants come back in May. They would present, um, you know, in their terms, would be a, for you know a final boundary, uh, you know, district um, design guidelines and a zoning bylaw. So you know, it would conclude their work. In terms of what it means for Amherst, it's really just kind of you know a first draft of of those three pieces of a 40R. 
and then it's really up to the planning board and others to determine is it you know appropriate to move forward so you know the consultant's task was really to develop something that is in um is in shape that the planning board could adopt it if they wanted or you know propose it be adopted and so they're really writing it as if it's a you know um you know natural zoning bylaw and design guidelines but for us it you know we can take it and then use it as as needed Okay. Any comments or questions? Yes, Carol. I just want—I just want to say that I, at least, if if the next step on the uh, emergency funding for housing thing that we just talked about, if that is ready and needs us to do something sooner than a month from now. I would certainly consider coming back to some special meeting in order to address that to keep it moving forward. So That's exactly what I was going to suggest, Carol. So actually, right. I was going to go forward and say, should we set another? Because uh, I don't think there's a huge amount of work to do to get this to the point where we could vote on it. Do we want to suggest a, a, a next meeting date that's sooner than a month? And then I would also ask, so there were two other documents that were attached. One was a scope of services for the administrator and then one, one was a kind of minimum requirements. So if anybody has comments on those, that would be great to see in advance of the next Good. meeting. And you can just um, email Nate those comments and then we can okay. get them incorporated. Okay. Does anybody have any reservations about doing this like a week from now? Is that, is that too soon? Okay, Will says yes. That's good. Carol? Carol, I can't hear you. Sid says yes. Okay. Carol, you're muted. If you're talking. <laughs> I just said I have something scheduled for a week from now, but I will try to change it if this is actually going to happen a week from now. Well, I, you know, Thursday night is what we've been doing, and um, is that that's not going to work for you, eh, Carol? If it works for everyone else, I will make it work. I can. I think I can do that. I, I, yeah, I mean, not that I have to be at the meeting, but I, I will. I have something from five to seven. It may go late. It probably will go later. So, I do have a meeting that evening. Does anybody want to suggest another time? Uh, a Wednesday night. Is that easier? Oh, shaking your head, Carol. No, it's not easier. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the problem, right? I mean, you know, when we try to set up these meetings. So let me see by a, a raise of hands of who thinks they can make next Thursday at seven. I'll make it work. All right. Looks pretty good, Carol. <laughs> I'm only raising one finger. I think I can make it work. <laughs> well, hopefully, John will be recuperating the document. Um, we will have a call. All right, okay. so we can say we can say May thirtieth at seven. That could just be a one item um, agenda, and then if we do our typical meeting, when, right. what 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 will be the next meeting date for everyone? Like May twenty first or May twenty eighth? Is that the and April thirtieth? Right, April next 30th. Wednesday. Next Thursday. Oh, sorry, sorry. Did I say May? Right, April. So April thirtieth. And then our regularly, yes, there will only be the one agenda item. And then our regular, it's the fourth Thursday. Would that be the 28th of May? I thought it was the 14th. I think, you know, we're a little, we're, you know, with, the, with this, uh, we're a little off schedule, but I'm, you know, would we need to meet on the 14th given our meeting tonight? I'm sorry. Is, what are you, what's our regular um, Thursday night? I think it was usually the second Thursday of the month, which would be... Um, it's it's uh, the second Thursday, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the 14th would be the regular uh, scheduled time. Correct. Okay. Does anybody have any problem with May 14th as the uh, next regular scheduled meeting? 
Okay. That's fine. Would we, for May 14th, would we want to say 6 p.m. for people? I mean, we can, if, if it's virtual, if that works better. Um, just throwing it out there. Why? <laughs> I can do six. Did anybody object to May 14th? No, I think we're good, Nate. Uh, yeah, but I mean, do we, do you want to have a seven o'clock start or do you want to do a six or 6.30? I can do six, this is it. Do people want to start earlier? Earlier is always better for me. Okay, anybody else want to start earlier, six o'clock? Yes, Sid would rather. Rob is okay. Carol? Whatever. Carol? Whatever. Will? He's good. Okay. All right. So, um, six o'clock on the 14th. And, um, and, and next Thursday, also six o'clock on the 30th? If that's a problem for you, me. It is. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily have to be there, but I can't, I can't make that time. Well, we need you to run this whole show here, so. Right. So we can do seven. How's that? Okay. All right. Seven on the 30th. Yep. Okay. Yes, maybe on the Maybe on the 14th, we would compromise at 630 since Paul said it was harder for him to get there earlier. Paul? No. I can meet. Whenever you guys meet, I can be there. Don't worry. Me. Okay. I'm sorry. So six o'clock on the 14th, seven o'clock on the 30th. All right. And anything else? I don't see anything. Do I have a move to adjourn? I guess we could take public comment, um, Tom, oh, if we have any. I didn't have see that on the agenda. Yes. Yeah, it should have been on there. Um, okay. Public comments. Do we have any? We have two members of the public still attending. Okay. Have they, has anybody raised their hand? Not that I see. Okay. Having heard no public comment, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And do I hear a second? Paul is seconded. Second. Oh, I thought we were going to stay here all night. Did <laughs> <laughs> made the motion. Paul seconded it. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Oh, we got a roll call. Sorry. Oh, Jesus. <sighs> okay, Carol. Aye. Bob. He says yes. Will. Aye. He says yes. Paul. Aye. Did. Aye. Okay, and I say aye as well. So, uh, we are adjourned. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank Have a good you. night. Bye. Really appreciate it. Bye. Okay, bye bye.